So what got you started into journalism? What, like, first got you interested or excited about doing journalism? Um, I loved newspapers from a, a really early age. I uh, uh, used to read the Nashville Banner. when It, it would come to our, our home every afternoon. And um, from, uh, you know, the age of six or seven, I was... Uh, I, I was fascinated by uh, the news, and uh, I really can't explain that. I don't know where that came from, but uh, uh, I was a regular newspaper reader uh, all the way through my youth, and um, and I uh, got interested in, in um, writing when I was in sort of junior school and joined the staff of the uh, Newspaper at Montgomery Bell Academy uh, in ninth grade. Uh, write sports uh, mostly for, for all the way through my high school years, but I ended up editing that paper as a senior and uh, went on to Vanderbilt, which doesn't have a journalism program, but did have a sort of journalism fraternity unofficially. Uh, uh, all the student publications were in Surratt Tunnel underneath the, uh, one of the main buildings. And uh, the publications tended to attract, uh, you know, non-frat boy types like me, <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, my closest friends in college were at the radio station, the uh, newspaper, the, a couple different magazines that were there, and so forth. And um, and I uh, I threw myself into into all of that. Um, and when I got out, uh, had a, a, a double major in English and classics, which uh, I thought might get me a job as a poet, but didn't. <laughs> you know, I just, I really had no idea what I was going to do when I got out. Um, and I went to work as a, as a paralegal for a local law firm, uh, doing business law mainly. And um, that was, was and remains a really valuable experience. I just spent 15 months there, but I learned all about public records, uh, where to find what kind of information uh, in research in the defense to a lawsuit or the uh, you know, securities uh, offering or whatever else was going on. I had to have to know my way around the courthouse, um, and the various court uh, clerk's offices and, uh, and um, various other areas where you would access public records. All of that, of course, at the time in the, in the uh, 80s was on paper and uh, I had, or on microfilm or microfiche. And I, I had to uh, learn to uh, gather that information by shoe leather. Uh, and um, I, I began to write for free for various little music magazines. And, uh, and I think in 87, when I was a year out of college, I got my first uh, uh, freelance assignment for the Nashville Business Journal. Um, Interestingly, it paid, as I recall, $150 for a uh, for a, a feature-length article, and I would bet you that today that's about what they pay for a feature-length article. The the uh, cost, the value of freelance labor has gone way down <laughs> over the years. The uh, value of journalistic labor in general really has has gone gone down with all the pressures the uh, industry has been under. Uh, and um, so I freelanced for them. Um, I got a, a marketing job with a company that helped banks market their services. Um, and uh, the owner or the, the CEO of that company uh, was an entrepreneur named Bill King who had, had a lot of different things going on, including and he, he wanted he had some ideas about media properties he wanted to create. So he sort of plucked me out of out of there and uh, made me the uh, founding editor of a magazine called Bank Director in uh, 1990, uh, and that was a great experience. That, that, as the name implies, that was for uh, board members of the banks, and um, so I was I was already moving in a direction mainly doing business journalism at that point, um, and I. Uh, got into the very specialized field of writing about banks, um, and uh, that magazine is still around today uh, and has been very successful. So, 
Um, you want me to take it on through from there and everything I've done? Or? Um, yeah, sure. I guess just go ahead and go into how you got working with the post or the scene. Or- sure. Well, um, uh, the scene was a, what's known as a shopper. It was a, it was a little, uh, very fluffy weekly publication that was thrown in people's driveways um, in zip codes that were considered to be affluent. Uh, I think it was started in the early 80s by uh, some people. So it, it was not no, known as a, a publication with any real uh, journalistic credibility and didn't try to be. And um, in the mid to late 80s, there was a, a rise of alternative weekly uh, papers springing up around the country. Uh, there had all, had, for a very long time, they'd been the Village Voice and the Chicago Reader, um, the LA Weekly. They had been around a while. Uh, but papers modeled on them started showing up in cities the size of Nashville. And I had a notion of trying to get one started here in the late 80s. Um, and uh, it did start, actually, with some friends. Uh, not, not a journalistic publication, really, at all, but sort of a music fanzine about the local music scene here called the Fireplace Whiskey Journal. And, uh, and that only lasted a few months, but um, it caught the attention of some people who were trying to do get a serious alt weekly off the ground here. And that was Bruce Doby and um, and Albi Del Favaro. Uh, they ended up buying the, the Nashville scene, just buying its name and assets, and turning it into uh, an alt weekly. That happened in the uh, summer of summer of '89. So I was writing for them as a freelancer in uh, some of their earliest issues, and um, and they I stayed involved with them, wrote occasional cover stories and uh, other s- stories for them, um, and uh, but I was working full time, uh, so I, I never went full time on staff there. Um, a lot of the people who were there in the early years are still good friends of mine. Um, and the current editor, Jim Ridley, who was their first um, empl- full-time employee, uh, I go back to Vanderbilt days with him. He was one of the people in Surratt Tunnel back at Vanderbilt. Um, and uh, let's see. So I was working full-time for the magazine, writing for the scene on the side. And uh, I left. Uh, I put all of that aside in ninety to do a uh, biography uh, of a man named Jan Karski who had brought some of the first news of the Holocaust out of Poland near, during the war. Um, so I got out of local uh, journalism for a year and a half or so working on that. Uh, not, yeah, not less than that, really, because uh, it was really just for 93, and at the end of 93, I joined the staff of the Tennessean. Um, the Tennessean at the time had been under the control of Gannett for uh, 13 years. And um, for most of that time, John Siegenthaler had remained in place as the editor and publisher there. Um, and uh, his legendary influence uh, kept Gannett from from doing too much to, to meddle with the uh, content of the paper. That was all changing as I got there. So there was a tension between uh, people who wanted to uphold the, the values of the Siegenthaler era when the paper had done some really great things, uh, although I will say by the 80s it was not doing much in the way of great things, um, and, uh, and, and people who were brought in from Gannett, who were journeymen, uh, you know, Gannett executives and so on, uh, uh, brought in to start to make it look more like the rest of the Gannett papers and look more like USA Today. Um, so I came in uh, inadvertently, stumbled right into uh, that whole tension. The editor at the time was Frank Sutherland, who had been um, uh, had, had come up under Siegenthaler and had done really fine investigative work for him on a staff that in the early 70s included uh, Al Gore and um, and Jerry Thompson, they were doing undercover investigations of the Ku Klux Klan and the 
conditions at the local mental hospital, which were horrific, and they they did a lot of great work. Um, Gore was very talented as a journalist, actually, and, and uh, got a number of scalps. You know, got uh, got people arrested, councilmen arrested in the council chambers because of his reporting and things like that. Um, so Frank uh, was trying to uphold those values while still doing the bidding of his Gannett masters. And uh, I, I had a very productive couple of years on staff at, at the Tennessee, and, but it was also a pretty unhappy couple of years. Uh, I did, for my very first story there, uh, this was not how things were planned, but I went to Frank in my first week there and I said, I've, I've learned uh, some things about guy in town named Richard Osias who uh, portrays himself uh, as sort of the leader of the Nashville moral majority type people. Um, he, he was launching campaigns against radio stations that were uh, doing risque things on the air and uh, he, uh, he was you know make, making himself known as a sort of moralist and I discovered uh, one thing that didn't make a lot of sense, and then another, and then another, and I finally peeled back the layers and discovered that uh, he had defrauded his own parents out of $100 million, set them adrift on a yacht, telling them that they had to uh, flee the U.S. to avoid being arrested on some kind of tax charges. So his father was on this boat dying. Uh, of, of, of kidney disease while, while he kept them away from all the rest of his family. It was a wild, weird story. Um, and it ran him out of town. <laughs> uh, he owned, he had built the house down Hillsborough Road here that has the huge fleur de lis fountain uh, in front of it. And uh, at the time, the biggest house in, in Nashville. Um, he spent about $5 million on it and sold it for about $2 million. Uh, and the paper let me... I mean, um, <clears throat> Sutherland got very engaged in that story and um, essentially let me take six months doing almost nothing else. Um, hired a uh, uh, stringer in Monaco because part of the story t played out in, in Monaco. Um, sent me to Florida and to Georgia to go through various public records and... Um, and spent a huge amount on lawyers because this guy hired the former state attorney general to try to sue me. Um, and uh, so that was the first time I ever had the experience of carefully, very carefully lawyering a story to, uh, to you know, make it litigation proof. Uh, and uh, that was a valuable experience that I've, I've repeated any number of times since then. And, uh, with various other publications. Um, so that story ran in May of 94, I guess. And I had a couple of other good investigative pieces while I was there, and I did a lot of business writing. I was on the business desk officially, although they would cut me loose for these investigative pieces. Um, and uh, I... Uh, eventually ran headlong into uh, a conflict between my values and the Gannett, Gannett values. Um, they wanted stories to, you know, uh, be short and sweet and uh, not too in-depth and nothing to upset the ad advertisers too much. And, uh, uh, and so I... Uh, decided in uh, September 95 to go out on my own and just freelance. Uh, I had a contract with a, a guy who was trying to write a business book that never really materialized, but I spent a lot of time working with him. Um, it was down in Memphis. And I, let's see, 